Dr. Satish Babu, it's a great pleasure to have you with us and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, given your busy, very busy schedule, you've you you taken uh, time out uh, to uh, uh, give this interview. Uh, to start with, um, uh, I just wanted to uh, know how you are dealing with this unexpected, unprecedented uh, situation due to COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, especially given your experience of handling patients at the front line. Could you talk um, about that, please? Thanks, Ashwin. Th th thank you very much for this opportunity. And I hope it reaches uh, people and who can get some benefits from this reflections. Um, we had the first case of COVID uh, positive patient on the 8th of March. And we were all expecting that it's going to hit us. Uh, but it, when it, the first case started, and in the first week or two, it was trickling like two or three patients every day. Uh, but then very soon, the numbers started to increase quite significantly. And towards end of March, we had pretty much most uh, patients were coming into hospital with COVID patients and all non-COVID patients had stopped coming to the hospital. And as a nephrologist, we also have to change some of the ways we work. Particularly, we have a significant number of dialysis patients who has to visit the hospital or a dialysis center irrespective of what the pandemic situation is. So our workforce, we have to make a lot of changes. And by end of March, we completely changed the teams. And it's extremely important. I want to stress to people that this is a pandemic. It is an unprecedented situation. And we have to work as a team, not just within the nephrology team, but with all the medical consultants in the hospital has to work as a team to get through these difficult times. So when start, at the peak of the pandemic, uh, which we have reached now, but I'm sure some countries are still heading towards the peak, what I would like to say is, I mean, the number of admissions will increase and a lot of patients will present with typical symptoms of COVID, like cough, fever, feeling fatigue, very tired, muscle aches. But sometimes, uh, one thing I would like to add is we have to be very careful. In the middle of all this, we might also get a non-COVID patient with cough is not the symptom of only COVID. It could be sometimes because of a cardiac failure or a respiratory infection other than COVID can also be a possibility. And particularly in nephrology patients, dialysis patients, or a transplant patients were all extremely vulnerable, who has a lot of comorbidities along with renal failure. We can still expect the same symptoms, but sometimes we might be caught up with non-specific symptoms. It might be just not feeling well, where it might not be a specific symptom or the temperature might not be that high. And feeling unwell is also a suspicion. We should raise that whether it is a possible COVID. And we have to keep COVID in the back of the mind all the time. And that's how we work. Uh, and when the numbers increased at the peak, then all medical wards had pretty much become COVID wards. And our work schedule, we divided the whole nephrology team of 10 consultants into diff two different teams. And to reduce the exposure to the COVID patients, um, what we did is, how do we do that uh, you to still look after the patients, but at the same time, we have to look after ourselves so that we can be there for the patients when it's when they are their need. So we divided it into two, te two teams, and instead of working like continuously, we said three days on the ward and three days off the ward. So you don't go to the hospital on the three days. Uh, even at the extreme times, we might go to the office to do some work, but we all had given laptops at home and we used to do a lot of work from home like calling patients and doing clinics all from home but three days when we were in hospital we used to see a lot of COVID exposure in those three days and that sort of helped to get a bit of balance between working in the hospital and out of hospital and reduce the exposure to COVID uh, 
um, did happen. And another change was uh, renal workforce, the junior doctors in renal was not sufficient enough. So what they did, what the hospital did a brilliant job. I think most hospitals did this. They pulled all the junior doctors like registrars and uh, foundation doctors, the trainee doctors essentially, to a team, a bigger pool, and divided them into all the COVID wards. And in fact, one of the good things which came out was the hospital was very well staffed. All the wards had enough doctors, both in the day and in the night. And for us, the change was you might go to the ward and then see a completely different specialty doctor. It might be an ophthalmology registrar would never worked in medical wards. It could be an orthopedic registrar, uh, or a surgical registrar trainee in a medical ward. And I know in some hospitals in, uh, in the country, there were other specialist consultants like surgeons and uh, dermatologists, rheumatologists did go into the medical ward and work in their capacity. I mean, you won't be working as a COVID specialist consultant, but you will be doing a lot of the jobs which any doctor can do. So th that's how we divided the work and got through this uh, difficult period. And now as the numbers have decreased, um, and at the peak we stopped all sorts of uh, outpatient work and patients coming into the hospital, like even our own kidney patients, we didn't bring them to hospital or even we didn't uh, contact them for a short period of time. But as soon as the peak ended, we, uh, because the three days we were working from home, we thought like, like we will do some virtual clinics wherein we've got a list of patients who we have to look after and then call them on the phone and talk to them, do the consultations over the phone. And one thing for as a nephrologist is we need to have a blood test to know what their kidney function is uh, to have any sort of discussion. So they used to go to the nearest uh, surgery, the primary care, to get a blood test done. Or if sometimes even the hospital opened the blood test facility for these patients throughout the time, so they can come in. But instead of like all coming in at one time, they need to phone and have a specific time so that they won't be like crowding in the blood test department. So that's how we managed and got their blood test done and did the virtual consultations and uh, effectively looked after our patients uh, reasonably well in this difficult times. Many people uh, with kidney ailments have this question. Um, could you tell us which people uh, or who with kidney disease uh, or which kind of people with kidney disease are advised to self-isolate or, uh, or other words, who are at the higher risk for COVID-19? Okay. Um, we have uh, what is called social distancing and also the extremely vulnerable patients. We ask them to shield, which is shielding is like 12 weeks. You don't come out of your house. So obviously, if you can't come out of your house, then you need a lot of help in terms of shopping, food, and all that. That was all taken care of by the government. And our job was to identify who were at that risk to stay completely indoors. And all our dialysis patients, all kidney transplant patients, and all patients, kidney patients who are on immunosuppression, like what we call immunosuppression is people on similar tablets like transplant rejection medications for a different type of conditions. Like for example, autoimmune conditions, we've got lupus nephritis, vasculitis patients, and some of the nephrotic syndrome on various medications, which are reduced the immune system significantly. So they were the extremely vulnerable group. And along with this, we also asked our uh, people with nephrotic syndrome, when you have like symptoms of nephrotic syndrome, so we ask them to shield. And advanced kidney disease, like stage four and stage five chronic kidney disease groups were also asked to shield. And the pregnant patients who has kidney disease, uh, even though there was not much evidence at the time, but we thought it's in the best interest until we know more best thing is to shield them. So all chronic kidney disease patients who are pregnant were also considered at a very high risk 
uh, for and some patients who are on steroid treatment, particularly on a higher dose of steroids, like more than 20 milligrams of prednisolone for their kidney ailment, then they were also considered as extremely vulnerable, vulnerable group and asked to shield. And the rest of the kidney disease patients, we asked them to maintain strict social distancing, they're not come in contact and follow the routine procedures like hand hygiene. And if you want to go out, wear mask and don't come in with contact with anybody who has any sort of symptoms uh, for their benefit. Great, great, thank you. I'm sure a lot of uh, patients uh, would benefit from that insight. Um, I came across a study uh, 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 which suggests that over one fifth of hospitalized COVID-19 patients develop acute kidney injury. Uh, could you share your experience and your thoughts on this, please? Sure. COVID pneumonia, I mean, initially we all treated it like a viral pneumonia. So when the severity of the disease worsens, there, any hospital patients, when they get ill, there is always a risk of acute kidney injury. What it means is like your kidney function can deteriorate very quickly. So it is a sign of any severe illness. So we have to understand acute kidney injury will be an inevitable element if somebody becomes severely ill. So what I'm trying to say is that is some part of acute kidney injury is inevitable, but at the same time, there is a significant part of avoidable acute kidney injury, wherein by proactive measures, we can reduce the risk of acute kidney injury, which will be a significant factor in the outcome of their hospital journey. So what we saw, I mean, if you look at the reports from across the world, the risk of acute kidney injury varies quite uh, to the massive range, actually. I mean, some patients, some centers have reported less than 5% of AKI, uh, whereas some, some centers have uh, recorded up to 70, 80% of patients developing AKI. I think people shouldn't uh, get too worked up with the, how this can be a massive difference, but I think it depends on the criteria for hospital admission. So, some patients, so in some centers, they don't admit any until they need ventilator. They don't get them admitted because of the um, capacity issues. And then obviously, if you are admitting only the very sick patients, then you will also see a very high number of acute kidney injury. But I think in most parts of UK and our center, we saw around 20 to 25 percent of patients developing acute kidney injury of various degrees. And out of all the patients who had acute kidney injury, the severe ones, that is stage three acute kidney injury or the acute kidney injury who needs dialysis or some form of renal replacement therapy were about 10%. So um, the acute kidney injury management became one of the prime areas for us nephrologists during this COVID pandemic. So when, as we said, we divided into teams and we used to go in, identify patients. We get a list of all the patients in the hospital who have raised creatinine during that day in the morning. And then we look at them, look at their profiles, all the other tests and go and review them and give advice and get them tested and see what medications are there, whether we can stop some of the medications if somebody needs an uh, nephrological opinion to go and see, we used to go and see and minimize the risk of avoidable AKI. Great. Thank you. Um, I understand that you know, NHS as well as CDC uh, have developed uh, clinical guidelines for managing AKI in uh, acute kidney injury in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And obviously you are uh, one of the clinical lead for uh, developing NICE guidelines as well. Um, could you please uh, talk about these guidelines and what uh, any key takeaways uh, from those guidelines? 
Sure. Uh, but I'll correct you. I mean, I don't do the guidelines, but I'm the, okay. I'll make sure that the NICE guidelines, when it is published, my role is to make sure that it is implemented and right. we are compliant with the guidelines and we help all the, the different specialties to make sure that they are in line with the, our practices in line with the guidelines. Uh, but again, uh, I should really congratulate uh, the NICE uh, team for bringing out these guidelines at a rapid speed. And th this is something which is one of the positives of this pandemic. Normally the guidelines takes months to be published. It has to go for a lot of consultations. And our NICE team produced these guidelines within probably hours or not more than a day or two that they came out with this uh, guidelines for managing acute kidney injury. I mean, in the UK, all hospitals do already have some form of uh, acute kidney injury guidelines on their trust website. It's not new to us, but what these guidelines made us is just to highlight, focus a bit more on preventing. And the few things which they added is, what happens is, um, in these um, patients with acute kidney injury who also need ventilation, the slight uh, tricky situation wherein to prevent the people getting uh, going on ventilation or to prevent the acute respiratory distress syndrome, which will lead them in onto ventilation, you have to keep the lungs as dry as possible. So in the process, if you keep their, try to keep their lungs dry, you, there is a possibility that you will dehydrate the patients, which in turn can cause significant acute kidney injury. So we have to get a balance between, we don't want to, uh, we want to treat the kidneys, we want to keep them euvolemic. What we say is fluid status at a, uh, as, as much as required. We shouldn't overload them. If you overload it, then it will affect the ventilation big time. But at the same time, we don't want to keep them dehydrated to avoid the kidney injury. So that was one of the challenges which came out in this uh, pandemic. So we, we dealt with that. And we also identified the patients who are at high risk of developing acute kidney injury, particularly the one with uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension on polypharmacy, particularly on different type of three or four antihypertensives, including diuretics and AS or ARBs, uh, and people old age, elderly patients are at a significantly higher risk of developing AKI. Uh, patients who already have some sort of pre-existing uh, CK chronic kidney disease are at higher risk of developing AK because the reserve is less compared to normal kidney function patients. And also people, uh, this fever, which is a significant symptom of COVID, when you have a temperature of 39, 40 degrees, you will become much more dehydrated. You lose a lot of uh, water. The risk of you getting dehydrated is much high in COVID patients because of very high temperature. And some patients with having temperatures of 39, 40 for days, with all the treatment, we couldn't get the temperature down and then that will also make them dehydrated and pushes them into developing acute kidney injury. So that's one of the things. So when we identified the at-risk patients and we tried to optimize their fluid balance to the extent to prevent acute kidney injury. And I would also like to tell you that, you know, when it started, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk on AS and ARVs that angiotensin converting enzymes and angiotensin receptor blockers, all the drugs ending with pril, ramipril, perindopril, and sartans, uh, has increases the COVID infection and had to be stopped. Uh, I think, yes, if you look at the pathogenesis, ACE, enzyme, ACE receptor will act as a carrier for COVID um, virus, but with, I don't think there is much evidence for that. So what we took a very uh, strategic decision is we didn't stop the medications who are already on ACE or ARBs because it's a good thing to do. Because if you stop the ACE, it might worsen the progression of kidney disease or sometimes it is for hypertension. And if you 
don't control the hypertension, then that will be an adverse factor. And if, if a heart failure, it can make the heart failure symptoms worse. So I think it's, it was counterproductive stopping this medication. So we kept them on these medications, but then they have to follow the sick day rules, which is, I mean, we normally, when we start patients on these A's or ARBs or diuretics, we always tell them, when you become unwell, when you don't feel well, or if you've got vomiting or if you've got temperature, you need to avoid taking these tablets temporarily. And if you're too unwell, obviously report to your doctor, but without even before you consult the doctor, you're safe to withhold the tablets for a day or two until you feel better. So based on that advice, I think we carried on with the people, people on ACE and ARBs. We had a lot of phone calls from patients as well regarding this, what we need to do. And this is the advice we gave. But we didn't start somebody on ACE or ARBs for hypertension because we had other options. So we avoided that. But if it is absolutely needed for, a, say, for example, if somebody has very high proteinuria, I think we didn't shy away from starting these medications because of the benefits it has. So I want to tell you about that. Um, and, the, uh, and the guidelines also did uh, eventually, apart from managing the acute kidney injury, it also touched upon the renal replacement therapy in COVID patients. And this, this question uh, uh, is more uh, for your fellow uh, nephrologists, perhaps. Um, are there any specific approaches uh, that you, know, you are uh, taking to reduce the risk of COVID-19 in hemodialysis patients? And um, what also uh, associated question related to that is, what nephrologists need to know about COVID-19? Uh, sure. Um, see, as I said, dialysis patients were shielded, which means they should not come out. But at the same time, they need to have dialysis three times a week. Uh, so three times a week. So then we have to. They have to come out of the houses for dialysis. So there is a significant risk of exposure to COVID by coming out to the hospital. So initially, when we had COVID patients in the hospital who came in. Obviously, the dialysis center, we don't want to bring them to the dialysis center because there are a lot of non-COVID patients who come for dialysis in the dialysis center. So what we did is we have a, we did dialyze them at the bedside. So if they're in an admitting unit or if they're in any other medical ward, we used to take our home dialysis machines. We've got dialysis machines. Uh, we one of the centers. We have got an excellent number of uh, excellent home, hemo, home hemodialysis program. And we use a next stage machine for that. And we took the machine, which is a portable machine, we can carry it. And the dialysis nurses used to go near the patient, obviously with all the PPE, and do the dialysis at the bedside and keep the, the machine for that patient for the duration of stay so that they didn't have to come across to the main dialysis center. So in that way, uh, obviously it's a lot of work uh, for the nursing team, but then we did mobilize the nursing resources in a way, and we were very effectively looked after the dialysis patients when they got admitted. Uh, and I suppose, I mean, in some centers, we, they might not be lucky enough to have this facility of doing dialysis at the bedside. And even for us, when the peak of pandemic did happen, we had too many patients whom we had to dialyze at the center. So what we did is we kept one shift of the dialysis shift. Like we, not, we can dialyze three shifts, morning, afternoon, and evening shifts in a day. So one shift, the evening shift, was exclusively kept for COVID patients. So all the COVID patients or the high suspicion of COVID, we used to bring them in that particular shift, uh, obviously use all the precautions to minimize the spread from patient to patient and also from patient to the healthcare professionals, did the dialysis and send them home. And we had, because they were coming in the evening shift and we had enough time to clean the machines and make the area safe for next morning dialysis. And so in that way, to, we avoided the mixing of COVID and non-COVID patients. But odd case when an emergency dialysis happened, I had to happen. Uh, then we used to dialyze them at the bedside. So we, by doing this, 
we did tackle this quite uh, effectively. And again, I would suggest for say people in a lot of the parts of India, if they want to do dialysis, yes, it is it is safe to dialyze, but we have to be extremely cautious in using the PP and also cleaning before and after the dialysis and avoid uh, cross contamination and cross infection. And another thing I want to add, uh, Yesh, is you know um, as this pandemic worsened, the dialysis facility, the dialysis uh, unit, also we provided dialysis in the intensive care team. One difference to the way we worked during this time, during the peak, is our intensive cares was inundated with COVID patients who are on ventilator, who also had AKI needing dialysis, needing renal replacement therapy. So what we normally do in intensive care is provide continuous filtration because they're on multiple medications. So every patient will have a machine and they will be on continuous dialysis like throughout their time, 24 hours sort of. But once the numbers increase significantly, then we had some issues with one number of machines and also the supplies, the fluid supply, the tubing supply were in short. And uh, it came to a point where we had to do think of out of the box. So in the intensive care, what we did is we provided the same like dialysis, like as we do for outpatient dialysis. In the intensive care, we identified two areas, bed areas where you can get the patients and do our nurses went and helped the intensive care nursing team to do the dialysis in the intensive care. And in, by that, in that way, we tackled all the patients who needed dialysis. So it can be done, the intermittent hemodialysis in the intensive care setting can be done and that's what we proved during this pandemic. And I know in some hospitals in London and other parts of the world, they also have done peritoneal dialysis in the intensive care setting. Uh, as soon as we hear of the peritoneal dialysis, we think, oh my God, how can we do peritoneal dialysis in a patient who's on ventilation? When you put a lot of fluid in the abdomen, it splints and whether it's going to be harmful to the uh, ventilation process. But actually, uh, King's Hospital in London has effectively showed that by doing peritoneal dialysis, they didn't compromise the ventilation significantly and did deal with the kidney failure quite effectively. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about uh, you know, um, thrice uh, weekly um, dialysis, but I came across uh, a, a new study which suggests twice weekly dialysis could reduce uh, the risk of COVID-19. Um, what's your opinion on this, uh, given that perhaps this could lead to other complications in renal patients? Sure, I think I did look at this uh, uh, paper. The twice weekly dialysis does definitely reduce the exposure of COVID. See, the less times you come across the healthcare, uh, then you've got less chance of infection. So that's about it. But I don't think twice weekly dialysis is the uh, only way to reduce the infection, or it doesn't necessarily improve the uh, patient survival, but actually what it is, ideally we need to have three times a week dialysis at least. And I know in some parts of the world, it's uh, still, the small parts of the world, it's still twice a week dialysis is the standard now. But if there is affordability is not an issue, I think the minimum dialysis is three times a week. What is, I mean, if the uh, strategy, what if we get like, if the nurses goes off sick or if too many patients become COVID or the hospital is full, so how do we manage the dialysis patient? So the strategy was anybody who can sustain twice a week dialysis, like say for example, you started dialysis recently, you still have your own kidneys, does some bit of working. So for such patients, if they have some residual renal function, then you are safe, they're safe that they can sustain twice weekly dialysis. So we did identify the number of patients whom we can dialyze twice a week. 
but we didn't have to because our peak didn't hit us so badly so we didn't have to go through that process but i would say by doing by assuming that twice week dialysis twice week dialysis is the standard norm uh, i don't think i agree with that because what it does is it does eventually lead to more uremic complications like you won't have your uremic toxins cleared very well your phosphate control will be affected your anemia won't be corrected properly your fluid hypertension control can be compromised by doing twice weekly dialysis so i think yes this is as it is an unprecedented situation in a peak of the pandemic if you want to do it twice a week identify patients safely who can easily tolerate twice a week and that's perfectly safe to dialyze them twice a week but to assume that it should be a routine procedure i don't think is the right thing to do thank you thank you so much um as a patient um moving on to uh probably slightly diverse uh, patients um uh, what are the precautionary recommendations uh, that you would suggest for uh, women uh, specifically uh, you know women with kidney diseases um, who are currently um, either pregnant or considering pregnancy during uh, this pandemic sure uh, as i said the patients with the uh, kidney disease who are pregnant we had shielded them uh the outcomes of pregnancy in chronic kidney disease this is due to covid has not been significantly different and also uh, we've seen even with non kidney disease pregnant patients who are developed covid pneumonia during this pandemic uh there are good enough studies i mean not a large number but there is a study of nearly 500 patients close to 500 patients where they had pretty much normal outcome of these pregnancies unfortunately in that paper uh, in the obstetric paper there is five patients who died but they're not sure whether they died of covid related complications we don't have the data yet but large majority did come out quite uh, with the normal deliveries and yes some patients required intensive care during this time but then they all have successfully come out um so i wouldn't worry too much about the outcome of pregnancy at this stage Uh, if they're already pregnant, uh, but if uh, what advice we give to our kidney patients? So, if you are intending to become pregnant in this time, if you can avoid delaying it a bit, I think is the best way forward because there are a lot of unknowns we are dealing with. We don't know how the situation would be in few months' time. So, I think if there is a chance, I, as time goes on, will become a lot clearer. So, the advice would be if you can avoid uh, for a uh, couple of months it's probably the safe and obviously you have to use the effective contraception and if you can do so please do but in case we become pregnant but we need to let the renal team and the obstetricians know early so that we can keep a very close eye on them and i also read the recent very recently a paper on the placenta uh, having some uh changes due to covid pneumonia it's a small study but it's very very significant um because any disturbance in the placental function can affect the baby uh, it might not be immediate you might not see it immediately but it might be over a number of years uh i think we are very early at this stage and it's only one paper so we need a bit more evidence to talk about that i don't think people should be alarmed or worried about a uh, pregnant patient should be worried about at this stage uh, but it's something an interesting fact which has come out and uh, i'm sure in the coming weeks to months we'll get uh, more studies on that one of the hot topics or one of the most and uh, widely anticipated answer is um is it going to be a vaccine or is it going to be a new drug for covid-19 what's your bet uh a uh, good question yes uh, th- i mean the drug uh between the drug and the vaccine it has to be vaccine because the drug whatever drug you uh trial or it's ready to be used you using a drug once the disease hits you but if you have an effective vaccine 
then you can avoid getting the disease. So in that, I think there is no question. It has to be the vaccine. But vaccine has its own challenges. And uh, we were all very, very positive that vaccine trials have started and we're going to get it uh, as soon as end of this year. Uh, but then again, two days ago, uh, the reports that Oxford vaccine might be delayed, not because that it is not safe, not because it's not able to recruit patients, but because in the UK, what's happened is the number of infections has reduced so much. If you vaccinate, say, 10,000 people, if very few gets the infection, then we can't, they can't test the vaccine is effective or not, whether it is safe or not. So in a way, it's a sort of a tricky situation where we want the infection to be in a certain number for the vaccine to work, but at the same time, we don't want the COVID infection at all. So I'm sure the researchers will find another place where we can test the vaccine. There's no doubt that eventually we will come up with, with a vaccine, uh, effective vaccine. Uh, but I think, yeah, between the drug and the vaccine, it has to be the vaccine. Okay. Um, every day uh, we hear new uh, information about COVID-19, especially uh, the, the complications associated with uh, COVID-19. It started as, uh, you know, lung-related complication. Then, you know, we started seeing other comorbidities like diabetes or people with cardiac problems um, and you know, we, we saw complications there and then more so we are seeing a lot of real complications and also now um, uh, um, pregnancy related complications as well. Uh, from your experience of you know, your, all your interactions with other you know, fellow doctors um, around the world, uh, where do you think this COVID-19 will end up as a disease? Uh, 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 good question, yes. The, I mean, regarding the pathogenesis of COVID, I mean, I'm sure there are uh, multiple theories which is still coming through. Uh, initially, we were all believed that it is like a flu because that's what was told by China, who on. And even the big uh, people in the field uh, put it as a flu and we thought okay to be maybe slightly worse than a common flu but then it turned out to be much more than that and now there is a question whether it is if you look into the pathogenesis very closely i mean say for for example in renal what we found is when we put patients on the filter in the dialysis unit in the intensive care we started the filters getting clotted very easily and that's a phenomenon that the patients are very, very prone for blood clots. So then we, uh, this, we changed the strategy of anticoagulation to these patients. So we increased the degree of anticoagulation significantly to minimize the loss of uh, circuits in the machine. And that became a standard procedure now. So all patients who end up in dialysis uh, in intensive care will be fully anticoagulated. So that's because the COVID infection, not just causing pneumonia, it's causing much more than that. So the theory is whether it is, I mean, sometimes the doubts arises whether it is just uh, pneumonia causing virus or is it more than that. So I think my, there might be a possibility that it is the endothelial damage, which is the primary uh, insult. And obviously, the endothelium in the lungs gets affected much more than other organs. And recently, there is few lung bio, uh, kidney biopsies which has been done for patients with acute kidney injury. And there is some evidence that the virus particles are being found in the kidney tissue by immunohistochemistry techniques. So that is something which we have to be keep our eyes open. I mean, this is again a very short study where the few number of biopsies done. And again, we, we touched upon the placenta having some changes. So it's all looking like whether it is a disease of the endothelium uh, affecting various circulatory systems. It's another possibility. Uh, towards the end of this, and I think maybe in a few months' time, we'll have much more better answers for these questions. But as of now, yes, it's not just a pneumonia. It's much more than that. We need to keep our eyes open. Uh, I forgot to mention one uh, complication which uh, we saw 
in renal medicine patients some of our akis was not all just due to multi organ failure and uh, dehydration we also had patients presenting as rhabdomyolysis which is a muscle injury so i know a lot of patients do, do present with muscle aches but sometimes it can be so significant that the muscle damage is so significant it releases the enzymes creatinine kinase into the system and it can affect the kidney and we had seen couple of patients with significant rhabdomyolysis causing acute kidney injury requiring dialysis so we need to keep that open as well so rhabdomyolysis again is it is whether it is myositis whether the virus particles affect the muscles cause myositis or is it just the muscle damage so those are the things which uh, have been well reported people will look into that a bit more so uh, babu you uh, touched based on this topic earlier uh, in the interview uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, uh, dealing with transplant uh, uh, patients kidney transplant patients um, could you talk uh, uh, a bit more about uh, how do you manage uh, uh, renal transplant patients in this covid-19 pandemic uh, given uh, the issues with their uh, um, uh, immunosuppression sure yes thank you transplant patients are on on this anti rejection medications uh, usually combination of two or three most of them most of our patients are on three different medications uh, one of which is a steroid and because of this anti rejection immune suppressive medications their immunity is low for any infection uh, including covid so we have to minimize the exposure to covid as much as we can so as again as i said we were shielding the transplant patients uh, to keep them safe and if they can get the infection we need to identify quickly and treat them uh, effectively so some of the strategies what we did was the patients who are shielding at home they can continue with the same medications with no change on all three medications i know in some parts of the country they did stop the one of the medications which is a anti proliferative medication like azathioprine or mycophenolate these are the two different uh, medications but there are this type of medications where during infections we generally stop them so proactively some people ask them to stop that and remain on another medication called calcineurin inhibitor like tacrolimus or cyclosporine so which is reasonably safe in covid patients and also there's some reports saying whether there is some slight benefit by using the uh, calcineurin inhibitors in covid patients but i think we'll not go about the benefits of that but they need to be of some immunosuppression so cyclosporines are safe so cyclos uh, calcineurin inhibitors are safe so cyclosporine and tacrolimus they can continue for patients who don't get the infection we continued the azathioprine and mycophenolate as normal along with the steroid and only once they get infection come into hospital or if they get infection and staying at home who don't require hospital admission we ask them to stop the azathioprine or mycophenolate type medication and also minimize the immune suppression like calcineurin inhibitors minimize as uh, little as possible use them and in steroid dose we continued on the steroid dose so by doing this we minimizing the immune suppression and still preventing the kidney rejection so it has to be done and all admitted patients who are if they are sick enough to come to hospital we stop their mycophenolate and azathioprine and continue on calcineurin inhibitors and slightly higher dose of steroids and there are some reports wherein we need to increase the steroid dose for this routinely because you're taking off one medication but i don't think it's necessary routinely we don't practice increasing the dose of steroids but if they are admitted patients and sometimes we had to get them off complete immunosuppression because they were very ill and if you take off both calcineurin inhibitors and tacrolimus for any reason then we can give them slightly higher dose of steroids um but the outcome of transplant patients due to covid pneumonia is pretty similar to uh, general population so we have effectively treated some of the transplant patients uh, during this period and i'm glad to say that uh, they come out quite well they've recovered uh, thankfully we didn't lose any transplant patient but i know in some parts of the 
country, they have lost, lost some patients to COVID. 